Hello, everybody. My name is Prentice Boxdale, and I hope that you have you enjoying this YouTube channel. Will you please hit the subscribe and like button? And y'all, we're going to have a hallelujah good time, but we got many more to come. And let's have a good time together. got to this church, this church was really abandoned. It was raggedy and we had all type of homeless people living in here and all kind of things. And we had a flea market behind the church that was causing a distraction. But God through his, his wisdom and knowledge has allowed those things to go. And we pray for that the Father will allow us to do some more things with this facility here. And that's what we're praying for. Yes, sir. Welcome. Good morning. I just want to talk about a little history of the Eastside Church of Christ. You know, Eastside Church of Christ has been a, a very sound church for many years because of some of the pioneers like Brother Jack Wooden Sr. who taught us well and, and gave us great guidance and Brother Al McLean and Brother Maurice McLean. Just a number of older men that have gone on now but certainly has given us a great foundation. And, you know, I'm proud to be a member of the Eastside Church of Christ. Been around 35, 40 years over here on Gallatin Road. And I'm just thankful for that. Because, you know, uh, great examples, they mean a lot. And they go, uh, they go a long way. And I just appreciate the Eastside Church of Christ. Today we'll be talking about the Book of Ruth. The Book of Ruth is a love story. It's a love story between a man and a woman, a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law, and God and his people. And I hope we can learn something today that how Christ is a type of Boaz, and that he is our Redeemer. And that's how we're going to, what we're going to learn today in the lesson of Ruth. Yeah. 
We 
I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. We pray for those that anybody on the sick bed, give them strength, give them courage, give them wisdom just to hold on unto your unchanging hand. Lord, just be with us in these old, this old weary world, for there's trouble on every hand. Every time, every time you try to do good, he will always show his face. But we know when we turn to you and call on you, everything is going to be all right. I said everything is going to be all right. We know you're in control. But if you can walk out in the graveyard and see a man just biting himself and cutting up himself like a wild man. But when you came on the scene, you healed a man. And the man was in the right frame of mind. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy. Amen. We know you was on time, God, when there was a lady that had leprosy. You healed a lady, she became healed of her sin and sickness. Hallelujah. We know you was on time, God. Amen. When there was a time a man that needed to go to the troubling water and he couldn't get in the water, but after they helped him in the water, hallelujah. You heal the man of a sin and sickness. We know you are the on time, God. You are the on time, God. There's nothing too big for you, nothing too small for you, for you made everything, and you know about everything. Right now, Father, we're praying for the members in the body of Christ that have lost their loved ones. We pray for Brother Glimpse in his family. Give them strength, courage, just to hold on to your unchanging hand. For you are God, you know everything, you know the season, and you know there is a day that all of us got to cross that river of death one of these old days. But Father, we pray as members of the body of Christ. That when we leave this world, we pray that we'll be found faithful in your body and doing what you said to before it's too late. But right now, Father, when you look down from heaven, we look upon the church of Christ here at East Side. Let us be planted like a tree by the rivers of water. That when the waves and storm of life come, we'll be found standing, holding up, hallelujah, this blood-stained banner. And this is our prayer in Christ Jesus' mercy and everlasting glory's name. Right. Let the church say amen. amen. I really love the
was personal, wasn't it? Mark in your books this morning. 599. <coughs> Come to Jesus. He will save you. Is our song of encouragement for this morning. 599. I have trials and tribulations. I've been ripped and I've been scorned very soon. My trials will be open. I want somewhere to live my will. Somewhere to live my head. And I want somewhere to live my head.
See, who can find a virtuous woman? See, her price is far above rubies. She can be married with children or, or satisfied single. She, her relationship status is defined or confined her spirituality because her mentality, her mind is after Christ. She's God's girl, offspring of royalty, a daughter of Sarah, past years, a lady of substance class, for who can find a virtuous woman? For Christ is far above rubies. We're going to be talking about a virtuous woman today. Ruth. The book of Ruth is a, is a love story. It's a love story. It's a three, it's kind of a three-pronged love story. It's a love story between a man and a woman. That's kind of on the surface. Then the next deeper little layer is a love story between a mother-in-law and a and, and our daughter-in-law. And also it's a love between God and his people. So we're talking about a love, a love story. The thing I like about Ruth is no miracles in the Ruth. It's just an everyday mundane kind of life. No miracles, nobody's raising from the dead, no fighting, no nothing. But it still has some what? Drama in it. Yes, sir. Has some drama in it. You can't have a love story without drama. <laughs> so we got to start off. Now we got Ruth. We start with read uh, 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 that passage there. That's one of the key passages there. So here is a virtuous woman. We have the background of some different names here. We have, first, we let's go to chapter one, Ruth chapter one. We're going to go through the whole book. I ain't going through the whole book. <laughs> But the short books. And now it says, now the days, now that come to pass, in the days of the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man in Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So he took this family, they had, there was a famine, what we would call a depression, or a recession in the land. So he took this family, and they moved over into foreign land, Moab. Moab, they were not the children of God. So it went over there. Now, the key thing about Bethlehem, if you know what Bethlehem means, it means the house of bread. Having a famine in a house of bread. Isn't that kind of ironic? Yeah. But now they're going to move over there from the house of bread into this other land. And now when they got there, this man was named Elimelech. And had named his wife was Naomi. And the name of the two sons was Malan and Chilion. So they had these two sons. We're not going to go... And they go to the land of Moab. So they had these two sons there. And then the, son, the, the husband died. He died off. And then the sons, there was, there was left two sons, and they took them wives of, of the Moab women. So it took a wife. And then there was two women. There was Oprah, oh, not Oprah Winfrey, Oprah, and Ruth. Two women there. Now they were going to be, and they were about, dwelled there about ten years. And then they died, Melian and Chilion. Now, uh, what's the name? Elimelech stands for God is our king. That's what his name stands for. All right. And Naomi's name is Pleasant or Sweetness. And his kid's name, which is some ironic names, they kind of end up living up to them. Their names were, uh, let's see if we can get this right. Oh, Melian means sickly, and Chilion means failing. So they died. They lived up to their name. Uh, and so they have these children here. Now the sons are now the father's dead, the sons are dead. This is a serious thing. If I want to name this lesson, Desperate Housewives of Judah. Y'all ever watch Desperate Housewives? Desperate Housewives of Atlanta. I know about all them crazy shows. And most of the time none of those are wives in those shows. And the same thing here. They're not wives, but they're widows. They're widows. So they're desperate. They don't have any men. No men in the connection, nothing they can do. This is a serious, no, what, what it means, no men, what does it mean? No leadership, no provision, no protection, no nothing. So she decided, what? Well, we're going to go, Naomi said, we're gonna, I'm going to go back home. They found out, let's read a little bit for a moment, it says, and she rose to her door laws, this is verse 6. And she rose to her door laws, as they might return to the country of Moab. And she heard that the country of Moab, Moab, Moab how the people had visited the people and given them bread. Okay, now let's move on here. And, uh, oh, verse 8. And then we said unto our two daughter in laws, Go and return each to your mother's house, and the, door, and the Lord deal kindly with you, as he had de you had dealt with me, uh, dealt with the dead and with me. So he reminded her uh, that she reminded her, Go on back home. Go on back home. You treated me good. You've been good to me. But you need to go on back home, because later on, now we're going to keep. 
Let's skip on uh, around here to verse 11. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters, will I, uh, turn, uh, go with me, and there will be their sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands. Now this sounds strange to us, doesn't it? Like, what in the world is this woman going to try to have kids for these girls, these women, to have husbands? But it doesn't. It's weird to us because that's not the culture that we grow up in. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. You got to go back to there a little bit. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25, verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. And if any brother dwell together, and one come, or one of them die and have no child, and a wife of the dead shall marry, not marry without, without the stranger. And her husband or brother shall go unto her and take unto him a wife and perform the duty of the husband's brother unto her. See, back in that day, if you had a brother, let's say I had a brother. I got a brother. If, there was so, if I had a brother and he was old and he had a wife and I'm not married, I'm, back in this time, I was obligated to marry, especially if they didn't have any kids. And then that, and then that brother, I would have the wife, the, the, the brother's name would be that. Let's say my brother was named uh, Paul. It would be Paul's kid, even though it was technically it's my kid, it's biologically it's mine, but it would be raised in Paul's name. So that's what it was all about. And you can hear about that in another story. It's also a custom, too. You can read about that in Genesis chapter, uh, I think it's verse 38. With Judah and Tamar. See, Judah was supposed to give Tamar, his daughter in law, one of his sons. He had one son, he died. <coughs> he gave another son, he didn't, he, he tried to, he, he took her, but he didn't want to conceive. He didn't want he just wanted to do his thing. And he ended up, God struck him dead. Struck him dead because he was disobedient. Because he didn't want to have that child's name and his brother's name. And then now the father, the, the father says, I gave her two of my sons. If I give her another one, what's she gonna do to this one? So the story goes, so this was what it's talking about, this these sons in my womb. See, that's what they, they saw marriage, it wasn't so much a love thing, it's a way to uh, spread the, the family name and a way of protection for them. So that's what she's talking about, so you won't get confused in the story. So they said, you gotta go on. I, I'm too old to have any kids. So you go on home. Now let's go back here. Uh, the first 15, what we started. Well, let's, go, let's talk about the part where they cried. They cried a lot about this. This is a sad thing, isn't it? No men, no way of making a living, no nothing, no protection, no provision. Now let's move on to uh, the verse 15. And he said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back to our people and unto our gods, and returned thou after thy sister-in-law. So Naomi said, Go on back. I can't take care of you. I got no sons. I'm too old to have kids. You need to go on back home. I can't help you. But you know what? You can't. Naomi was a good person. But you can't, you know, good people can give you some bad advice. Good people can give you bad advice. Just and don't dis, don't don't discount them sometimes, because it can happen. Don't get mad at people because it's not always, it's not out of uh, evilness or that they want to hurt you. They're just thinking, like, this is not practical. Go on back home, and you get with some man in Moab, and you can take care of it. Right. And, you know, going back to your guys, and go back there, that's what you, that's what you know. Right. That sound, doesn't that sound practical? Right. But it's what? It's bad advice. Yeah. And sometimes good people are going to give you some bad advice, and don't be surprised when it happens. Right. But don't get mad at them either. <clears throat> but look, because what did Ruth say? In verse 16, verse 16, this is a, Famous thing that they say at weddings all the time. Entreat me not to leave thee, nor return to follow after thee. For whether thou go, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and where thou be buried, the Lord will do with me. And more, and more also, I to death depart from thee and me. So he's not talking about a husband and wife here. This is talking about a, between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. This is very ironic. You know how mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws are in this modern day. They're kind of what? At odds with each other. Fighting over the son or the grandkids or whatever. But this is what? This is talking about she's pledging to Naomi and also to the God of Israel as well. That she's going to make the, her God is going to become her God. 
So, and let's look at verse, uh, verse 18. And then let's look what Naomi did. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded with her, she left her, and she left speaking unto her. So she, Naomi didn't say anything else about it. I guess Ruth said, well, I guess she wants to stay. I guess I would. You know what I'm saying? So she was what? She, was, she had a, a determined mind. She didn't really know what was, what was going to happen, but she knew she couldn't go back to the false gods. She had learned something there that, you know, I can't go back home. You can't always go back home either, can you? Because sometimes you need to go go forward, get out of that place. All right. And then in verse 20, now we've got a name change. Verse 20. And then we say, don't call me, don't call me Naomi no more. Call me Mar. Remember we said, Naomi, what does Naomi mean? Pleasant. Sweetness. Mar is bitter. I'm just bitter. You know, and she felt like God is, in that verse 21, it says, God has done, done bad and afflicted me. And he just, she just felt down in the dumps. My son, my husband's dead. Two sons are gone. What am I going to do? So she just felt... She fell down. Mm-hmm. You know, now I got this girl, this woman with me. She wants to go with me. I guess I can take her. Maybe she can help me. Yeah. All right. And now they went along. And verse 22 is going to lead into chapter 2. Now, I would like to, I forgot to tell you. It's, this part, this story has four parts. Girl loses boy. Girl finds a new boy. Girl makes a move. Boy makes it official. So that's it. So now we got this part. She's lost her first boy or lost her first man. Now they're going into the land of Bethlehem, back to the house of bread. Now, it's, it's, and during this time, it's the barley harvest. That's when they harvest all the barley, the wheat. All right. And this is not a coincidence. It seems like it doesn't seem but mundane, everyday life. There's no big, no big story. Going back to a time of barley. Okay, whatever. You just kind of repass it. Don't take anything about it. But this is when she's going to meet what? Boy. Chapter 2, verse 1. And as we see, Naomi had a kinsman and a husband, a mighty man of wealth, and a family of Limelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, what does Boaz's name mean? <coughs> see, these names mean something. Back then, they named they people after something, you know. They just didn't name you for odd uh, stuff. Uh, his name means strong and redeemer, pillar. You know, he has this name, it means something. So he's, he's about trying to redeem this woman. Here you got Boaz. It's going, it's going back to the land. Now they're going to glean ears of corn. So that's this in verse 22. So what is gleaning? You got to go back to Deuteronomy. I think it's in chapter 25 somewhere. 25. Uh, 25. Yeah. 24. 24 verse 19. Not going to go back to all that. But back then they would glean the field. Like let's say this is the field. The corners. They leave the corners open. They didn't take from the corners. This would be a corner. So you had a field with four corners, leave the corners undone. Anything you drop, you don't pick it up. You didn't, you know, you know, that was, because it's about taking care of the people that were poor. Now the poor people have to come get it now. They're going to come and pick it up before you take it to your house. They had what? They had to do some effort as well. And also, it's something about giving. When, when, if I'm giving to somebody or somebody's giving to me, we see the interaction, don't you? If I'm in need and a brother or sister helps me, I can be what? Grateful, can I? I said, brother or sister, thank you so much. I really needed that. And then they can see, they can feel, they can feel some kind of satisfaction that they helped me. And now we're what? We're building a, a relationship with each other, aren't we? But when you're getting, I won't say it. When you're getting a check in the mail, when you're getting a check in the mail, there's no relationship. Don't you think about that? You're just getting whatever check you get. And you just get it, and you don't think nothing about it. You don't see the, the contact, the human contact of giving. You know, that's something that's important. It's important. And when you do that, you become what? Entitled. You become inspected. Where my check at? Or my deposit hasn't come in, or whatever. You know, and that's the kind of mentality that we agree to bring about. I'm all for charity, but it's something about when it's voluntary and when it's personal. It does. It transforms the person that gives as well as the one that's receiving. Right. So it's something. So these people had to come out to the field. They're not gonna come get it. You gotta go out there and go get it. Right. Go pick it up. So she said, "I'm gonna go out." I'm looking verse in verse two. She said, "I want to find what grace that I may that shall find grace." She said to my daughter. So she said, "I'm going out to the field." She learned that Boaz had a field. 
So she went out there to what? To work. To glean, to pick up the, the what's left over. And she's going to find some grace. <coughs> she put her place, herself in the right position, did she? She didn't sit at home and just say, well, I'm going to sit at home with my mother-in-law. We're just going to wait around. But, but she what? She what? Made her move. She got busy, did she? Can't find God out there without doing it. You can't find him, whatever, man. What are you trying to find? You can't find that just sitting at home, can you? So she went out there with, with a reposition. She got busy. Now, I like what here. What else did she do in this verse that's amazing? And Boaz, he said, who's that girl? He saw her. And they said, damsel. Who's that damsel? Who's that girl over there? And they got that. Because you, you had a reputation. Everybody knows something about you a little bit. Believe it or not, whether it be good or bad, true or false, they, you have a, a, a resume out there somewhere. And they said, the servant said, she, uh, the servant said unto Boaz, Oh, she is Naomi. She's Naomi's daughter. She's a Moabite. I was like, oh, so he kind of got an idea of who she was. So she had some kind of connection. And he remembered, that's one of my, my kin, close kinsmen. And then, then, then they finally met in he, verse 17 and verse 7. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and continued even into the morning until now. And she tarried uh, in a little a little to, into the house. So she worked. So she met him, and she was, she was grateful. She doesn't say, I'm supposed to be cleaning your bill. <laughs> she was what? Thankful. Uh, she had a what? A, a, a way of humility. Yeah. And then let's see what Boaz said. Let's, let's read a little bit further down. And then Boaz said, here is thou now, my daughter. Don't glean in another bill. Just stay here. You don't need to go nowhere else. This is where you stay. So he's showing that he's going to provide for her. He's going to give some, her some type of provision, some type of protection there. And he told her to be with fashion with my maids. Get with the women that work with me. Stay with them. And then she would, and then let thy eyes be fast on the field and read. Them. And I have not charged the young men that they should touch thee. And then thou, uh, so he's giving her some type of provision there. And talking about also the vessels to drink. So he's, so he's providing some foods, protection. They're going to take care of you. That's what he's doing. Now, let's move on into verse 10. She fell on her face. Could you imagine that? She fell on her face. And what did she do? Bowed herself to the ground. Thankfulness. I, I tell you one thing, like one of my new pet peeves is people that ain't thankful. That kind of get under my skin real bad. You can't make me bad. I don't think it means anything, but don't be thankful. I'm grateful. You think I'm supposed to do something for you? But she what, what did she do? She bowed down and she said, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's, that shows you some, show you some humility there. Isn't it? There's a lot of practical things in that. When I think about when you, you know, this is a love story. Think of it as been a modern day Ruth. Boy, well, about time you give me something. You've been gleaning in this field. You know I'm your, one of your closest relatives. But she did what? She didn't act like that. She didn't come with that entitled attitude. She came with a, a way of thanksgiving. And God, that's what God said. He's going to give grace to the humble. He gonna, that crowd, look, God hates it. I'm just saying, he despises it. And that's a, it goes into the realm of being unthankful. And then, now we keep reading a little bit further along. And he, he said, now Boaz got, in verse 11, he got some information. He's Now he's filling it out. He said, you've been with your mother-in-law all this time since the death of her husband. And then you didn't want to go back to the home of your nativity. You're back, to, back home to where you grew up. And then he recognized that. He did not, I'm going to also tell you, did he say anything about what she looked like? Read the whole chapter. You don't hear nothing, anything about how pretty she was, what kind of body she had, what kind of clothes she had on. You hear nothing, nothing about it. A lot of times the Bible does describe women as beautiful or men as Handsome or he doesn't describe her physically at all, but he describes her virtue. Now she's competing on a whole nother level. See, you want to compete with all the other people that are trying to be pretty and handsome. You got what? You got a lot of competition. It's a lot of people that are pretty or handsome. You got a lot to contend with, don't you? But virtue is rare. You got some virtue and stuff. You got something. You got something. 
So he said, I, re I know who you are. You take care of your mother-in-law. You didn't, you didn't go back to your homeland. You, you, you want to be one of God's people. Now we keep reading a little bit further along. Here we have, uh, she said, let me find favor in the eyesight. My Lord. Now she's not talking in religious sense. It'd be like the term sir in our, in our day and time. Sir. You know, respect. Can't you imagine something every day? Sir, thank you so much. She had a different mindset. And that's not just goes for men and women, everybody. Be had that mindset of gratefulness. That when people do things for you, sir and ma'am, thank you and appreciate it. You can never go wrong. If you're able to write a, I know uh, my mo mother has a good uh, habit of writing uh, cards, send them out to people. Maybe nowadays you can email somebody something. Whatever you do, don't let your, be thankful for, for people. They don't, they, because when they do good for you, let them know that you appreciate it. So she said, sir. Lord, without, and she said, uh, that you've been friendly unto me, unto thy handmaid. This is some, some serious stuff in Thy handmaid. Now she's trying to claim it. Now Boaz said unto the meal, so now they had a meal time. Now he's providing bread. This is in verse 14. Providing food to eat and uh, something to drink. And so he's providing things there. Now, let's move on. Now, they met each other. <coughs> now he, he, he and he also told her, he also told his servants, let drop a couple of little extra things for her. You, you see something extra drop something out there. Now let her get it. Don't tell me. So he was trying to provide for her. He did, and he didn't want her to know, always to know. He already let her glean in the field, but he's what? Trying to be also humble too. The book of Ruth also teaches us how to deal with poverty and also how to deal with being in power too. You don't want to take advantage of people when you're in a power position. So he didn't just say, well, okay, you, you're going to do what I'm going to, you're going to do what I tell you because I'm you in my field. But he wanted to uh, provide for her, and he didn't always want to let it be known. All right, so now we got a couple lessons there. Now we got, now she goes back home, and she said, in Naomi's path, you met one of our relatives. You met, you met him. You met Boaz. So they kind of kept that in mind there. All right, so she said, stay in the field and stay there until the end of the harvest. Now let's move on to chapter 3. Okay. Now we move on to chapter Now, girl makes her move. She's making a move now, y'all. And the mother-in-law said unto my daughter-in-law, Shall I not seek rest until thou may, uh, may be well with thee? And now as Boaz is our kindred, who is, um, who is waste, behold, uh, went the barley tonight and the threshing floor. So they get ready to what? To get the, 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 the all the, uh, the corn, the wheat, and the barley, all that together. You know, so this is when they're going to process the food. So they're going to kind of break up the chaff from, from, the, from the real stuff. So they said, you got to do it tonight. Because when they did it, there was like a big party or a big celebration after the fact. So they said, you know, this is the time he's going to be, they're going to be well drunk. Uh, they're going to not necessarily drunk. They're going to be eating and drinking. They're going to have a good time. He says, and when you find out where he's going to be, mark the place. So she gave us some advice. I don't know. I was kind of, when I was studying this, I don't know if it was kind of shady or not. I don't know. You can kind of leave it up to yourself. I don't know. But she told him when he finds the place where he's going to be laying, where he's going to be laying down. That night, because they because they gotta protect the stuff that they that they uh, harvested. They just can't go home and leave all the stuff un undone. So they gotta be right there with it. Okay. So now uh, that's what her mother-in-law told, uh, told her to do. So she said she's gonna do it. And uh, I like it, verse four, verse four in chapter three. It says, "And he will tell thee what thou shalt do." <coughs> so I don't know what that meant, but we know. Hopefully, thank God that Boaz was what he was also virtuous too. Wasn't he? They were both two virtuous people. So the story ends up, you know, it's going to end good. I'm going to kind of break, break it for you. So now what? Now she's going to get ready. I forgot to tell you this part. And what does she tell her to do? Get yourself ready. You want to get yourself ready? What do you got to do? You got to wash yourself. This is in verse 3. I forgot to skip that. That's a very important verse. Wash thyself before thy and anoint thee and put on thy raiment. That's about the only physical thing that we have there. Wash. Get cleaned up. Get anointed. Put on some clothes. <laughs> but that's the same thing that we have to do with Christ. So we just can't just, it's not so much the physical clothes, but we have to what? Get prepared. Often in the Old Testament, they often tell the people, get washed, get clean. 
You just don't show up to God in any kind of way. You got to, especially you're trying to what? Be in his presence. So she got herself prepared that night, didn't she? So she was ready. She's washed up. She's anointed. She put some clothes on. And she's already virtuous already. So she already had that going. All right. Now, after everybody's, you know, on <coughs> to sleep, and now you got Boaz. She's down there laying down, good and sleep. All of a sudden, this woman, this woman, she laid in her feet, and she was instructed to lay at his feet. Can you imagine waking up one night? Are you out there? You've been working all day. You know, they in this barn, kind of agriculture type place. And you're in this barn, and all of a sudden, this woman is, oh, you And the thing about that, on his feet, it, it means something. It's, it, she didn't lay by his side. Y'all get me? Mm -hmm. Laying by his side, what do you think it means? It means something sexual, something carnal. But she's laying at his feet. What do you think laying at his feet mean? Submission. Something I'm, I'm your, I'm, it's a different thing. She didn't offer her sexuality, she offered him her submission. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, people don't like talking. This sounds like old school crazy talk, no. But it's more, it's anybody can offer the sexuality, anybody. Sexuality, okay. But if some woman offered you her submission, oh my goodness. What would you do? Now, that, that's the way. Now, that's better than the meal you can make. Anything. That's something, that's just a, this is the thing that she was to, to teach you to think about. It. So she, this man was laid at her feet. She was laid at his feet. And now, and now she's waking up and said, let's, let's see what she says here. He was eating and drunk and the past and midnight. Oh, okay. And now verse 9. And he said, who art thou? He knew who she was. He knew she she was. Now she's going to what? The pine. She answered and said, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. She already said that once before. Now she's saying it what? Again, thy handmaid. This is almost, what would you call this? Is it a proposal? In a way? It's kind of a proposal, isn't it? I am thy handmaid. But he's, she's just not proposing to any dude. This is a guy that's what? Proving himself. He's a man, he ain't just no Joe Blow. Here's a man that's giving you protection, provision. He showed himself to be worthy. He showed all these things. And now she's what? She's laying herself before him. The same thing as we do before God. We lay ourselves at his feet. Lord, what you want me to do? Whatever you do, I'll, I'll do. And he said, now he said, Ruth, thou handmaid, spread thy skirt. And he spread it. He said, and I said, Ruth, thy handmaid, and spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid. For thou art the near kinsman. So he took that skirt. You know, they had all these long kind of things that they wore. And she kind of, they kind of covered her. And that skirt was kind of a way of, of protection and provision. It symbolized those type of things. He said, it's kind of like you, you and I are mine. Remember back in the day, people give them varsity jackets to a girl? Yeah. Oh, you know, are you? I'm really good. I'm more. Or they would give them a ring, or they used to wear the class ring, and now they give them engagement rings and stuff like that. But he said, now what? I'm, you're mine. I'm protecting you. I'm putting you, I'm covering you up. I'm you're now my, my woman. You're my handmaid. I'm going to take care of you. And that's a serious thing there. Isn't it? You want that man to be able to, to do what? To want to be able to put that skirt of protection, that uh, wing of protection around you. And often at time I think about this, this skirt of protection, I often go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to talk about it long, but it's often one of the things that we skip a lot. And it stands for position and authority. And it stands for being under something. You read the whole scripture, we're not going to talk about that right now. But it stands for something, and it's, it's kind of odd how we, we talk about other stuff, baptism, What's up? But we just kind of skip over that part. Let that y'all do that, y'all. So I'm reading on that. And it's one of the things that we see that's a, it's a really almost a more of an everyday thing. Daily thing. We just kind of pass over the provision and protection of Jesus and Christ. So you take it as you want. Now, now she's got now she's got the provision. She's got the protection. Now they gotta do something about it. Now let's keep reading on. Let's move on to verse. Uh, now my daughter. This is verse 11. Fear not, thou requires, and indeed the city people, so he's going to tell the people of the city that thou art a virtuous woman. Again, virtuous woman. 
He said it again. And now, Terry this night, that's in the morning, and performing the, the part of the kinsman. So he told her what he's going to do. I'm going to do the part what I'm supposed to do as a kinsman, to redeem you and the land, to get the land back to you. And she laid at his feet until morning. This is in verse 14. And she rose up, and no one, uh, therefore before no one could know another. And she said, let not, let not be known that a woman came unto the floor. So she was discreet. Discretion. That's something lacking. Discreet. She just is like, hey, y'all, everybody. Hey, I got, I got Boaz. He said, I got the way to make this official first. Look at him. She, she didn't do that, did she? She was like, let me get out of this place. I don't want to be, you know, they, they weren't supposed to be down there at this time. So she got out and lived. And I think I know I know that they didn't do anything wrong because we didn't agree about other verses in the Bible where they did wrong things. And the Bible doesn't say that. She just laid at his feet and she got out of there. Now, Boaz had to kind of help her out. If you're reading this, you just kind of skip past this part, verse 15. And he said, Bring a veil, and thou hast unto thee, and hold it, and held a measure of six measures of barley, and he laid it on her, and she went into the city. Now you just read that and just like, well, he gave her some more stuff. But it's more than that. He had to give her something. To, he gave her a cover. What I mean by that, where are you going this late in the, in the middle of the daytime, morning time, and you got nothing in your hand? <laughs> just out. You, are you street? What are you doing? You out here? It's like if you see somebody out 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, four o'clock, four, let's say early in that. Four, four, five, three, early in the morning, whatever it is, you're going to think it. And they still got their regular clothes on that you saw them in yesterday. <laughs> you're going to think, what are they doing? But he's kind of what? He's kind of giving her an alibi. He says, you've been out, because she's already been known for what? Gleaning, isn't she? He didn't want to destroy her reputation. He didn't want to do that. And he also is a way providing for her mother in law as well. And in verse 18, he said, still, my daughter-in-law, this is what Naomi's saying, you know that what the matter shall fall, and a man will not rest until he spends the thing this day. So he's going to what? Make it official. They both saw the virtue in each other, didn't they? She was virtuous. Boaz was virtuous. Because he was not a virtuous man. And he said, she's laying in his feet. He said, well, come on up to my side. If she wasn't a virtuous woman, she would say, she'd be like Tamar and say, I'm going to lay it aside. So they were both what? Virtuous. Two virtuous people there. And the mother-in-law said, he's going to handle this thing. He's going to take care of it. He didn't what? Wait around. He just said, I'm going to seal the deal. Now in verse, the last chapter, the boy makes an official. I don't like to say boy. Well, I say man makes an official. He makes an official. He goes into the gate of the city. It's in chapter 4, verse 1. And he's going to make it what official, and the gate is what they call like official place. <coughs> he said, and he got the ten elders there, and then there was somebody else that was closer to him. I forgot to tell you that part of the story. There was another person that was in line to be a closer kinsman, but this guy said, I don't want to be her. I don't want to take him. Uh, I want to take the land, but I don't want to take the woman. <laughs> and, he, and and that, but the woman and the land, what they were, they were doing deal. You can't. Separate the stuff. And he wanted he wanted us to stuff without the land. Because she was what? She was a, she was not a Israelite for one thing. She was, you know, and it wasn't something he really wanted to do. Because and also it hurt his inheritance as well. Because he, if he takes his inheritance, he can't take another inheritance. And so boy says, I'll step in, I'll take it. I'll take her. And he took her on his way. And he took off his shoe. So they took off his shoe back then. Took off his shoe. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter. Verse nine. And they took off. That was a way of like signing the deal. They didn't sign contracts and stuff. So he took off his shoe and said, this is going to be my wife. I'm redeeming her. And not only am I redeeming her, I'm redeeming Elimelech and all the people in his lineage and his children. So that's what he was going to do. He was taking on all those other people as well. And there's a lot to learn in the story here. And we also learn about uh, about Judah and Tamar. That's a bad example. Bad example. Judah and Tamar's story, we mentioned it earlier, how she tried to, she didn't try, she tricked her father-in-law, thinking she was a prostitute, to, in order to get conception, or in order to get pregnant. And he ended up finding out 
that she was pregnant, and they said, she's not supposed to be pregnant. She's not supposed to be having no man. And he wanted what? The stone, uh, the burner. Not stone, the burner. <laughs> and then he found out she brought out the, the evidence and said, did the more coverage on him. You're the father. <laughs> and that was it. And so the story, how, see how that happened? See, Ruth was what? Innocent and virtuous. While Tamar was kind of on the treacherous side, you know, kind of scandalous side. But they're all in the lineage of Christ. You go back and read that in Matthew chapter 1. All these women, Tamar and, and Rahab and, um, and um, what is that? Bathsheba, they're all in this, the lineage of Christ. And that's unusual. They didn't put women in the lineage <coughs> of anybody, especially Jews. They didn't do that. So it shows that God was engrafting not only Gentiles, he was engrafting men and women into his family. Now, let's talk, I'm going to talk about Boaz a little bit. Why do you think Boaz would take Ruth? You got to know a little about Boaz's background. Everybody got a background, don't they? <coughs> Who was his mom? Who was his mom? His mama was Rahab. His mama was Rahab. Rahab, Rahab is also, they also call Rahab the harlot. Rahab the prostitute in the Bible. So his mother was a, a, also a Gentile, a non-Jew. So he was familiar with this. But he said, it's kind of like, you know, people say, you're going to marry your mama? <laughs> In some ways, you got to be careful because you end up marrying your mother, your father, the same father. But his mother was what? Was also a Gentile as well. So he knew about the suffering of being, being with the outcast as well. Now we got the lesson today. Now Christ is what? Our redeemed redeemer. Now he stood in our place. He took all the things that we couldn't take. He stood, you know, he became a man. Not only did I think that, he didn't become a man, he became a baby. Started from the beginning, a baby. And then he became a man. He suffered like us, but he didn't sin. He didn't do any wrong, and no guile in his mouth. So he is our redeemer. And you can read about those things. I'm not going to read all that, but you can look through those scriptures in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 20, Ephesians chapter 7. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. And so those will give you some New Testament type of stuff, talking about how Christ is our redeemer. He's our Boaz. And the church is his root. And he's engrafting us. And that's the beautiful story about it. That's the last part of the love story. That this, why did you think they put this love story in here? You think it is about, uh, uh, they just stuck it in there? This is a line of Jesus Christ. This is all what it's all about. This is telling you, you, it's telling you how this all tied in. And it also tells you in the last verse, it talks about, and so and so, got so and so, all that. But we know about David, king. But in this verse here, I think it's interesting. They didn't call him a king. So it wasn't a king yet. Because they would have called him king or something. But this is kind of telling what's going to happen in the future. Now, we say all that to say what? We want to. We want to be. We learn a lot of stuff. Then we want to learn to be. We want to be uh, humble. We don't want to be entitled. We want to be virtuous. We want to be we seek the protection of God. We learn a lot of different things. That Christ is our redeemer. He's standing in His place, and He's only going to redeem His. He's not going to redeem everybody. It's like if you have a wife, you take care of what your wife. It doesn't mean you don't care about other people, but what you have a responsibility to. Her. Your woman. And if you have a husband, you both what? Listen, I'm going to say, obey your husband, not what? Other men. You have an obligation. And we're both are, we're obligated to Christ. He's coming back for what? His church. And he's going to redeem it. And he's going to wash it up. He's going to do it. Gonna, hopefully, we should do some pre washing with the Word of God because we don't want to do, do all the washing. But he's going to get some of the other stuff off. But we still got some sin in our lives, even, even, even at our best. So he's going to redeem us. Now, y'all like y'all want to test a quick test? I'm going to give y'all a quick test. What city did they come from? I'm going to give a multiple choice test. What city did they come from? Did they come from Bethlehem A, Jerusalem B, uh, Cairo C, or D, uh, Memphis? <laughs> Which one? You, might, you can answer in your mind. A. All right, what three men died? Was it Limelech, Chilion, and other? Or was it uh, Mer uh, was it Curly, Moe, and Larry? Was it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Was it uh, the 
Three wise men. What did Naomi tell her daughter-in-law to do? Did he, she tell him to, uh, did she tell him to uh, go away? Did she tell him to come with her? Did she tell him to come part-time and visit her? Did she tell him to call him on the telephone? Okay, I get that. Okay. What about what? Who left and who stayed? Which daughter-in-law stayed? And what was her name? Was her name? Uh, was her name? Which one went away? Was it uh, Oprah Winfrey? Yeah. Oprah? Uh, Ruth? Or Sarah? Oprah. Oprah. Who was a close kinsman? Was it Was it David? Was it uh, Abraham? Was it Boaz? Or was it uh, Moses? What was Ruth's job? Was she a farmer? Was she a prostitute? Was she a gleaner? Or he was unemployed? Gleaner. All right. What, uh, what did, uh, let's see if I can't even read my own writing, y'all. Oh, what did Ruth do? What did she want to find when she went to the field? Did she want to find a new job at the field? Did she want to find grace? Did she want to find a boyfriend? Or does she want to find some, some assistance? Grace. And what was Boaz, well, how did Boaz help her? Did he give her some new clothes? Did he buy her uh, uh, some perfume? Did he give her some wheat? Or did he give her a new cell phone? Okay. So, y'all get into these things. So when you go out of here, you'll have something what? And now he says what? I said, now, what did Naomi tell her to do? Did he tell her to put on some makeup and get your hair fixed? Did she tell her to uh, put on some high heel shoes? Did she tell her to uh, put on, uh, put on, wash herself and put, anoint herself and put on new clothes? Or did she tell her uh, to take off, take off her clothes? We already know. Now you learn, aren't you? You learn it. Is. Okay, now what else now? Okay, now what did Naomi, what did Ruth, what did that boy has called Ruth? Did he call her his, his uh, friend? Did he call her, did he call her his sister? Did he call her a troublemaker? Or did he call her his handmaid? And what did Boaz give Ruth when she left? Did he give her a ride back home? Did he give her uh, a ring? Did he give her six barrel uh, barley things of bar bar barley? Or did he just say, uh, I'll give you a call? <laughs> last four, last four here. Now Boaz went out to what place? Did he go out to the, to the club? Did he go out to uh, town hall? Did he go out to the gate? Or did he go out to the field. Not to the game. Why did the closest kinsman not want to take Naomi? Because he didn't because she was ugly? Because he didn't like her? Because he had another inheritance? Or he was afraid of Boaz? He had another inheritance. See how much y'all learned already? And now what what did Boaz take off? Did he take off his tie? Did he take off his hat? You take off his skirt, or you take off his shoe. And the last one. And what is the best known descendant in Ruth? In this chapter, was it Jesus? Is it Boaz? Is it David? Or is it Jesse? David, David, not Jim. Right. So now you are, you are what? You learned something today. You don't have never say you can learn. Man. And who is our what? Our redeemer. Right. Jesus is our closest kinsman. And who is he going to redeem? His church. And what's he going to do to his church? Oh. He's going to wash it up. So you learn something today. You got all this thorough. And that's when you take these stories. When you hear any preacher, you should be getting something in your head and gathering. And like, oh, 
You're gleaning like proof. You're getting all the stuff. You take, I'm going to take this in my life. I'm going to take this in my life. I'm going to use that. And oh, I think you use all of them. You know, like this book says all. So it's a lot in there. And I just pray that you make your decision. That you won't go back like, be like Oprah. Go back. I think her name, I don't know, it's not really sure. But she went back. You don't want to what? Go back. When you learn a good thing, <coughs> when you learn something that's good and is righteous, but stay with it. Don't go back. It's so easy to go back in it. It's so easy to hang <coughs> with the crowd or the regular people. Is. It's like, well, go back to your family. They'll take care of you. But you got what? You got a new camp. You got a new way of living. You got a new way of thinking. Because you go back to your family, what's going to happen to you? You ain't going to convert. You can't convert that man. you got to get well, converted first. Maybe you can go back to them. So I pray the lesson is yours today that you'll be able to take this today and be like Ruth and, and you can be like Boaz and be virtuous. That's all it takes. Being virtuous. Be that kind of person who's a person of the word, a person who's willing to go the extra mile and to do the things that's unexpected. And as we gather the scenes, Thomas. Come to Jesus, he will save you, though your sins and his crimson grow. If you give your heart to Jesus, he will make it go white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to You know, becoming a Christian is such an important thing in any man's life. The most important thing a man will do is not to become a president of a company, is not become a CEO or the president of the United States or a congressman or, or just a principal or a manager. But the greatest thing that man can do is to obey the gospel. Somebody says, what does that mean? Well, Romans 10, 17, that faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And once you hear, you must believe it. Hebrews 11, 6, and once you believe what you've heard, repent it, make a change. Sometimes that's difficult to do, but it can be done. And then once you repent, the Bible talks about confession, confessing him, Matthew 10, 32. Then the Bible talks about baptism, Acts 2, 38. You know, that is the greatest thing that a man could ever do is go through those five steps and become a child of God. Bible says, what if a man gains the whole world and he loses his soul? What has he profited? Absolutely nothing. So, I'm just trying to tell you, if you ever want to be successful, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. just say that if you're interested in, in becoming a Christian or having a Bible study, we welcome that. You know, you can call me, 615-397-5878, that's my cell number, but we'll be glad to have a Bible study because you know what? The only way you're going to know is study the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15. We must study to show ourselves approval. So I'm just saying, we'll be glad to do it. It's just a matter of you making the phone call. We'd be glad to have that study with you. God bless.
Yes, sir. Welcome. Good morning. I just want to talk about a little history of the Eastside Church of Christ. You know, Eastside Church of Christ has been a, a very sound church for many years because of some of the pioneers like Brother Jack Wooden Sr. who taught us well and, and gave us great guidance and Brother Al McLean and Brother Maurice McLean, just a number of older men that have gone on now but certainly has given us a great foundation. And you know, I'm proud to be a member of the Eastside Church of Christ, been around 35, 40 years over here on Gallatin Road, and I'm just thankful for that. Because you know, uh, great examples, they mean a lot, and they go, uh, they go a long way. And I just appreciate the Eastside Church of Christ. We that love the Lord and let our joys be known, join in a song with sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne, and thus surround the throne, said Said a beautiful, beautiful Zion, Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And let those fruits who sing, who never knew our God, said, but children. Thank you. 
Amen. And may the Lord have blessings <coughs> over the reads and doings of his holy divine word. If we've all found it, let us sing page 54. Have you left your room this morning? Did you think to pray? Sunlight is his heavenly sun. 
has flooded my soul with, with his glory divine. And I said a hallelujah. You know that I am rejoicing and I'm singing, I'm singing his praise. Said you know that Jesus is mine.
then we will be finished. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And our thought for this evening is, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Our message is, let there be light. We know, in, as we have been around for a while, that this is talking about the creation and talking about the, the makings of earth. And we know the light. We know it to be to us the sun and the lesser light, the moon. And there's other little lesser lights, stars, and so forth. But I don't want you to concentrate so much on when I said our service, uh, our title is Let There Be Light, to think about the moon and the stars and the sun so much on this evening. We need to concentrate our focus and understanding as far as light on another light. The light of the world. Not the S, what, U N, but the S O E. That is the light that we are talking about. Let there be light. In the beginning, God created. Do you not know in the beginning the S-O-N was already here? Turn your Bibles over to John chapter 1. Ken, I don't know why you got so far back. <laughs> John chapter 1 will let us know. That is the light. My, my, my reader. In the beginning was the Word. Uh huh. And the Word was with God. Yes, sir. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Keep on reading. And all things were made by Him, and without Him, not anything was made that was made. Come on. In Him was life. And the light was the light of me. There we go. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's good. Right. As you can see from this reading, that in the beginning, the S O N, mm -hmm. the light, was there. Yes, from the very beginning, as we said, Genesis means the beginning. Right. Let there be light. Let Jesus illuminate in your life. As we come rapidly to a close, if, if you would turn your Bibles over to 1 John chapter 1. And I think this will sum up this real quickly. And the message will be your John chapter, 1 John chapter 1. And the verses are. Verse number five. It, 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 talk, it speaks my message or the thought I'm trying to convey. Read verse five. This then is the message. Oh, yes. Which we have heard of him. Come on. And declare to you Amen. that God is light mm -hmm. and in him is no darkness at all. Amen. That's our message. Let there be light. 
is our message for this evening. And even in the beginning, as you, as you, if you look at it, it says, let there be light. And he created the light, and the light and the darkness was separated. We just got to reading that he is the light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Darkness is termed as sin. If you do not walk in the light, you are walking. Or walk in Christ, you are walking in darkness. And we just got through singing it. And all of y'all were singing. I don't watch it. Heavenly sunlight. Walking in sunlight. All of my journey over the mountain through what? Veil. Oh, that's some rough stuff. So let there be light in your life. For those of you that do not know how to receive or to get in the light. The light came down and lived among men. And he suffered and he bled and he died. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. The light is still shining. So if you believe that Jesus Christ died and that he rose again, you are a candidate for baptism. And you can be in the light and out of darkness. For those of us that have taken those, taken those steps, and for some reason, as in the parable in Matthew chapter 5 said, do men take light and Put it up on the bushel or basket. No. He takes it off and it shine for the whole world to see. Right. Uh, some of us need to take our, our shades off our lamps and let the whole world see. Let there be light. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness as we together stand and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a look. Or, or just a principal or a manager. But the greatest thing that man can do is to obey the gospel. Somebody says, what does that mean? Well, Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And once you hear, you must believe it. Hebrews 11, 6, and once you believe what you've heard, repent it, make a change. Sometimes that's difficult to do, but it can be done. And then once you repent, the Bible talks about confession. Confessing him, Matthew 10, 32. Then the Bible talks about baptism, Acts 2, 38. You know, that is the greatest thing that a man could ever do 
is go through those five steps and become a child of God. Bible says, what if a man gains the whole world and he loses his soul? What has he profited? Absolutely nothing. So, I'm just trying to tell you, if you ever want to be successful, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. just say that if you're interested in, in becoming a Christian or having a Bible study, we welcome that. You know, you can call me, 615-397-5878, that's my cell number, but we'll be glad to have a Bible study because you know what? The only way you're going to know is study the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15. We must study to show ourselves approval. So I'm just saying, we'll be glad to do it. It's just a matter of you making the phone call. We'd be glad to have that study with you. God bless.